Greetings to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ from Lutheran School of Theology in Gothenburg, where I am serving as Dean of Chapel. My name is Jacob Appel, and I have been asked to contribute to this wonderful series of lectures that Lutheran Study Days are giving. And I am happy to contribute uh, and also very happy for the work of Lutheran Study Days. Freedom towards other people with the topic that I have been given. I would like to begin by saying that for someone to be free towards other people, he or she must be freed something from something and freed to something. To be free towards other people, I must first be set free from the fear of them. And when I am, I am free to serve them. The word fear is here to be understood in a broader biblical sense, not just being afraid of. The key theme in this short lecture will be to point to the freedom from such fear, which is also the driving force to live a life of service to other people. First, freedom from fear of men. According to the Lutheran understanding of original sin, we are born without the fear of God, without trust in God, and with an evil desire. This is Augsburg Confession, Article 2. That is, we do not naturally fear God, but we fear nonetheless. To fear is intrinsic to our human nature. It's just that the fear of God has been replaced by other fears and have become our primal fears. Fear of men is one of them. Fear of men has two sides. We strive to avoid the negative judgment and treatment of men, and we strive to win their affirmation, their positive treatment. Avoid disgrace, win favor. To a certain degree, this is natural and even necessary for us to live together as human beings. But when the fear of God, when the fear of men becomes the primal fear and not the fear of God, we will ultimately be driven by the opinions and treatments of other people. According to John's Gospel, many of the authorities believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. And I quote, For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. John 12, 42 to 43. These are the two sides of the coin again. They feared the Pharisees and the direction of men, and they loved glory that comes from men to be inside the community, that is, of the synagogue, not outside. But note the little word, more than. That is, they love the favor of men more than the favor of God. They feared men more than they feared God. Again, this is the damage and the curse of the fall, original sin, to fear men more than God. And it is deeply tragic. To love the glory of men is to live for the lesser glory. What could possibly be more glorious than the approval and appreciation of the eternal God? And the glory that comes from sinful men is inevitably subject to change and ultimately decay. Closely related to live for, uh, closely related to live for the glory of man is to live for the justification of man, to be declared righteous in the sight of men. Jesus said to the Pharisees, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Luke 16, 15 The Pharisees knew that if they were considered right and blameless by men, they would also be exalted among them. Or so they thought. Justification became the path to glory. But again, they searched for the lesser glory 
and were consequently content with the lesser righteousness, the justification of men. When Jesus demanded a righteousness exceeding that of the scribes and the Pharisees, the strictest and most serious of all people involved with religion, he simply demanded righteousness before God, not just men. This goes back to the question, whom we fear. Jesus said that we should not fear those who would not only kill the body, not being able to kill the soul, that is, we should not fear men. But the only way to escape such tremendous fear, if you think of what men can do to us, is to consider the greater fear. Jesus said, Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28 It may be strange to some to think of God in this frightening way, which has led some interpreters to think that Jesus ref here refers to the devil. But the point is that we should be more afraid of what God can do to us than what men can do to us. Freedom from the smaller fear, that is, that of men, lies in the greater fear, that is, that of God. To fear God more than men. It is worth noting that Jesus, immediately after referring to God as frightening, speaks of his love and care in the most tender way. He likened us to sparrows, tiny and insignificant as they are, and yet cared for and known by the Heavenly Father. How much more with us? The Father numbers even the hairs of our heads. And so quite paradoxically, Jesus ends up saying that we must not fear, since we are of more value than many sparrows. Fear not, you who are to fear God, who can destroy both body and soul, because when you flee to him who is frightful, you find the greatest refuge. How this paradox can be has to do with salvation, which according to the Song of Zechariah is to be able to serve God without fear. Zechariah himself met the frightening God in the temple who struck him mute for not believing the word of the angel. Only to contemplate on God's word for nine months and at the birth of his son John, sing God's praises in a most stunning way. Zechariah sang about deliverance from enemies, service to God without fear, and forgiveness of sins because of the tender mercy of our God. Luke 1, 78. Zechariah feared God without fear. Feared him rightfully, as a holy God whose words were not to be questioned and whose rightful wrath was to be poured out on his Son, on our behalf, on the cross. But without fear, since his sin of unbelief was not to be reckoned against him. Holy and righteous before God, he said, Luke 1.75, would be his standing all the days of his life, not as something he could present to God out of his own effort, but as God's gift to him in Christ. The word before God is significant here, as discussed before regarding a righteousness exceeding that of the Pharisees. Such righteousness may not be apparent before men, nor for oneself, but still be present before God. The text collector stood far off the temple and would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Luke 18, 13. And Jesus said that he went down to his house justified. 18, verse 14. Not the Pharisee. But he, the Pharisee, he was content with righteousness by comparison not to God, but to men. It is here fruitful to use Martin Luther's own experience to illustrate what has so far been explained. 
Life as Augustinian monk was hard for him, not because he was unable to fulfill his duties and spiritual exercises, on the contrary, he was considered more devout than most of the monks, but he was terrified of God and his terrible judgment, and in a sense feared the one who could destroy his body and soul in hell. He did not care what men said, who thought he was far too scrupulous, not even what men of the church said, who encouraged him to strive on and hope for God's imputed grace and the merits of the saints. How can I find grace before God when I take into consideration all that is known and plain to him? In other words, how can I enter the kingdom of heaven when I do not know if my righteousness exceeds that of the, of the Pharisees, those considered the most righteous at Jesus' time? Luther's struggles continued until the gospel was revealed to him through a word of God, where his frightening God declared him righteous before God by grace alone, through faith alone for the sake of Christ's atoning work alone. Luther afterwards described his experience as if the gates of paradise were opened. When Luther could cling to God's promise, he did no longer have to fear God's condemnation. When he found assurance of not only God's forgiveness, but also God's delight in him, he was in fact set free to love him, to trust him, to find, to find peace in him. The saying is that you cannot love someone you fear, and yet you fear the one you love. In his small catechism, Luther repeatedly stated that we must fear and love God. For Luther, it was impossible to love God until he had found favor with God and solid ground for such favor, namely in the sure promises of God's forgiveness. This must be remembered when we consider Luther's fearlessness in face of not only the mightiest of the church, but of the world, namely Emperor Charles V at the Diet of Worms in 1521. The emperor demanded of Luther to recant from his writings including his On the Freedom of a Christian, his little book, since Luther feared God more than men, he considered it unsafe and unsound, unsound to go against a conscience bound by the word of God, and so he would not recant. But his bravery came from the gospel, that he was declared righteous by faith in the greater judgment than the one he faced in Worms. He loved the glory that had already been given to him, that had come from God more than the, he loved the glory of remaining included in the synagogue of his time, to paraphrase John 12, 43. He was free, as he had so beautifully written in the book on the freedom of a Christian, a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none, that is, completely free towards other people. Psalm 118 verse 6 states, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Luther courageously lived out his faith before the emperor. You can hit me, but you cannot get me. You can kill me, but you cannot take my life. My life is hidden and safe in Christ, who on account of his sacrificial death has declared me holy and righteous before God all the days of my life and for eternity. This is to be of more value than many sparrows. This is also the beginning of true service of other people, to be a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all, as Luther also wrote in his book on the freedom of a Christian. 
And this is my second point. Free to serve men instead of fearing them and the driving force behind that freedom. Luther's fearless confession before the emperor was not only a selfless service to the church, but to all of mankind, especially if the consequences of the alternative are considered. That is, recanting from the truth of the gospel out of fear of this world's mightiest. When you no longer serve in order to win God's favor, thereby ultimately serving yourself, and no longer serve others to make sure you yourself are acceptable to God, because that's already a given reality, you're set free to serve others for their own sake, as one who has been served completely by God himself. You're set free from the necessity to serve and save yourself because of the promises of God's full service and salvation for you. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? As Paul says in Romans 8.32 it is important, however, to remember that the fear of men will prevent us from serving them. We will be absorbed with ourselves if we focus on their opinions and reactions to our service to them. The fear of God is what is lost through original sin, and we will suffer from its absence and its haunting substitute, fear of men even as fully justified and pleasing before God. But when the Holy Spirit is at work leading us to fear God more than anything, it has in fact two fruits. The release from fear of men has already been mentioned, but the other has to do with the experience of fearing God. Luther's fear of God made him all too aware of sinful thoughts and desires, perhaps hidden to men, but fully apparent to God. Some suggest that Luther was far too scrupulous, but he knew that the word of God discerned the thoughts and intentions of his heart and that they were exposed to him to whom we must give account as it is, as it is written in Hebrews 4.12. It is worth noting how St. Paul perceived himself before his conversion, namely as a blameless Pharisee according to righteousness under the law, which he says in Philippians 3, 5, and after his conversion. In Romans 7, he explained that it was the command to not covet that eventually killed him, that is, in his own righteousness. This is Romans 7, verse 7. The law produced all kinds of covetousness, that is, he became all too aware of what was taking place in his heart, fully known to God, but not known to him nor others in his life as a zealous and blameless Pharisee. At the end of his life, St. Paul considered himself the chief sinner, 1 Timothy 1.15, not as an exaggeration, which would have been the judgment of men, but as a fruit from the fear of God, whom he realized that he had tried to eliminate when he persecuted Christ's own body, the Church. St. Paul and Luther, his disciple, found freedom in the righteousness of God given by grace through faith. Since we have been justified Justified by faith, writes St. Paul, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 5.1 and 8.1 In line with Luther's concept of men being righteous and sinful at the same time, Simul Justus et Peccator, there is also freedom to fully accept the reality of sin dirty as it may be, and is 
in the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And this is important also in relation towards other people, as we can see in the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18, verse 21 and the following. The end of that parable appears to be completely absurd for two reasons. First, the servant's depth was bizarre. No individual could gain such a depth, and not even a king would be able to lend that amount of money to one individual. 10,000 talents meant 150,000 years wages. And secondly, in the servant's harsh attitude to his fellow servant, the servant seemed utterly blind to what he had received for himself. The conclusion of Jesus was that our guilt before God is far beyond our own comprehension. And to fear God is ultimately to affirm this reality, which is likely the reason we do not fear him naturally since the fall. It's too dangerous. While fearing God at the same time reveals an unfathomable release from the whole depth, as the parable tells. But Jesus' conclusion is also that, uh, that we are to see other people in the light of unbelievable grace granted to us. In the encounter with other people, there is an inner dynamic to our own encounter with God. We may recognize that our neighbor's depth is 100 denarii, as it is stated in Matthew 18, verse 28. But in light of our own depth before God, we will treat the neighbor as the chief sinners ourselves. Similarly, when Jesus warned us from judging others in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verse 1 and the following, he did not ask us to ignore the speck in the brother's eye. In fact, he asked us to remove the speck, but only after having a log removed from our own eyes. That is, to have clear sight to treat the brother's eye without destroying the whole eye. It is necessary to observe the log a thousand and, a th and another thousand specks uh, in the own eye and how carefully God in Christ has removed the log without damaging the eye. The chief sinner is humble and merciful enough to do something about the speck, which inevitably chafes and in the end also destroys the eye. It would be loveless not to do anything about it, but the humility that comes from the realization of one's own guilt before God and God's pardon makes all the difference in relation to others. The exhortations in the New Testament are, repeat, are repeatedly motivated by God's love for us. Love, forgive, serve, welcome one another as Christ has loved forgiven, served, and welcomed you. There is a necessity in the dynamics between how we want God to treat us and how we treat others. Where the call to repentance from all lovelessness towards other people always is to take another look at the depth, 10,000 talents, and the unbelieving grace granted in Christ. Granted in Christ. He who is forgiven little loves little, said Jesus to Simon the Pharisee after telling another parable about debt, release from debt and love. Simon loved little because he had been forgiven little, not because the debt, his debt was insignificant, but because he considered it as little in comparison to the woman, the sinner. Who had generously washed the feet of Jesus. She loved much because she knew she had been forgiven a lot. Luke 7, 47. 
Freedom towards other people does not come from staring at one's own debt, but from living by Christ's grace alone. When St. John wrote about perfect love in 1 John chapter 4, it had nothing to do with us, but of God. He's, he writes in verse 10, This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. But worth noting is that St. John continues to say that love is perfected in us and with us in two ways. The first way is no surprise, namely that we love one another as God has loved us. This is 4 verse 10. But the other one is more unexpected. By this is love perfected with us, he writes in 4.17, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. How on earth is it possible to be confident before God's judgment? The answer is, when God's love is perfected with us, not the other way around, that we gain confidence by our own love before God. And this love is described as Christ's propitiation for our sins. St. John explains this by saying that we are as him already now in this world. That can never be experienced in this world or achieved by us, but it can be believed for God's love Propitiation for sins and righteousness to be clothed in is given and promised. St. John writes that whoever fears has not been perfected in love. 4 verse 18 But this love has the power to cast out fear. Any fear related to God's judgment. Any fear related to a fearful God himself. And so St. John concludes by saying, We love because he first loved us, and we fear him without fear. Lastly, and thirdly, some practical implications. Abide in me, abide in my words, abide in my love, said Jesus, and you will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. John 15, 1 and the following. In him and through him we are set free to bear fruit for others to receive to the glory of the Father, as he says in verse 8, tasteful fruit, because it originates from our communion with Christ divine. Generosity will come from knowing the grace of Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that we by his poverty might become rich, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Contentment, freedom from envy, greed and boasting will have its source in the Good Shepherd whom nothing, with whom nothing is lacking. Love that is patient and kind comes from knowing that the riches, I quote, the riches of God's kindness Forbearance and patience lead us to repentance, as it is as it is, is written in Romans 2, verse 4. Love that is not arrogant or rude, irritable or resentful, insisting on its own ways, comes from receiving God's sacrificial love for the chief of sinners. God can never rejoice in wrongdoing and falsehood, but with us and our wrongdoings and half-truths, he is love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. To paraphrase St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and the following, his love never ends, and he urges us to love like him, as loved by him, who loves the other sinners just as well. This is never without cost and sacrifice. When we reach out to people like Zacchaeus, 
and face the reaction that Jesus himself met, that the people of Jericho grumble at him. Luke 19, verse 7. We are motivated by his steadfast love for us, as if we were the Zacchaeus. Christ's love must not be confused with niceness, however, love without integrity. Christ's love for the people in Nazareth meant that he left them. His love for them was a gift, not a right, something deserved, as the people in Nazareth thought because they were his neighbors and countrymen. In the end, they could not stand him nor his words, his clearest expression of his love for them. We, write, we read this in Luke 4, verse 14 and the following. We are in Christ actually set free to not sit at the seat of scoffers, as it is written in Psalm 1, verse 1. Similarly, we are not to affirm what stands in the way for others to encounter the truth and the love of God, as Jesus in an indignant way showed the disciples who tried to hinder the children from coming to him. Mark 10, verse 13 and the following or as he angrily showed those who sold and bought in the temple, whose commerce became a hindrance for encounter with and prayer to the God of Israel, in the house of prayer for all people, Matthew 21. Freedom towards other people is also with the thinking of St. Paul, to be weak for the weak, 1 Corinthians 9.22 or Romans 14, verse 1 and the following, and hard against the heart, to the heart in Galatia he was fearless and ruthless, warning them that they would lose grace and were obliged to keep the whole law themselves if they insisted on circumcisions, circumcision for Gentile believers. Uh, we read this in Galatians 5, 3 and the following. Whereas he was willing to circumcise St. Timothy out of respect for the Jews in Lystra and Derby. Acts 16, verse 3. Freedom from the law, as St. Paul further explains in the letter to the Galatians, is not meant for abuse and for the free course of selfish desires, but for service and love in harmony with the service and love of the crucified Christ, who set us free from the law and its curse as cursed in our place on the cross. Galatians 3, 13, 5, verse 1 and the following. The fruits of the Spirit in our lives do we receive from Christ first. His love, His joy, His peace, His patience, His kindness, His goodness, His faithfulness, gentleness and self-control in our place and for our sake, for us to taste, to see that he is good, to paraphrase Psalm 34, verse 8. Without him, apart from his fruit for us, we can do nothing. Galatians 5, 22 and John 15. But in him and through him, there is nothing missing in our love and service to others.